Good afternoon, colleagues, students, and guests. I am Dr. Inga Musselman, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost at the University of Texas at Dallas. Today it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2024 edition of the Polycarp Cush Lecture Series, Concerns of the Lively Mind. In a few minutes, Dr. Hassan Perkul, Dean of the Naveen Jindal School of Management, will introduce today's lecturer, Dr. Elaine Bensusan, Professor of Management and Lars Magnus Erickson Chair in the, in, in the Naveen Jindal School of Management. But first, I would like to share a little bit of background about Dolly, Dr. Polycarp Cush and the lecture series. You may know that Dr. Cush was a member of our physics faculty for 10 years, from 1972 until his retirement in 1982, first as Eugene McDermott Chair and then as Regental Professor. He came to the University of Texas at Dallas to help build a new university in a cotton field near Dallas a university from the outset that was destined to be not quite like the ones that were in existence at the time. This was immensely appealing to Dr. Cush. Dr. Cush was born in Blankenburg, Germany in 1911. He was educated at Case Western Reserve University and the University of Illinois. He spent much of his career at Columbia University in New York City, where he was professor of physics. At Columbia, he also took on administrative roles as physics department chair, vice president and dean of the faculty, and then vice president for academic affairs and provost. In 1955, while at Columbia, Dr. Cush was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics with colleague Dr. William Lamb for their contributions to the knowledge of the atom. In collaboration with another Columbia physicist, Dr. Henry Foley, Dr. Cush conducted experiments to precisely determine one of the electron's most important physical properties, the magnetic moment. This work has been instrumental in the development of new technology, including magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. In addition to the Nobel Prize, Cush was awarded eight honorary degrees, and he was elected to membership in the National Academy of Sciences, among other honors. A longtime educator, Dr. Cush was not only an eminent physicist, but also an award-winning teacher. It was reported that Cush dearly loved his work, especially the teaching. As he once said, I describe myself as an adequate scientist, but I am a superb teacher. At Columbia, he was chosen to teach an introductory physics course for non-science majors, informally known as Physics for Poets. Columbia awarded him its greatest teaching award. At UT Dallas, Dr. Cush was known for his lecture demonstration course called The Phenomena of Nature, for which he assembled a first-rate collection of equipment to show physicists and non-physicists alike just how nature works. Following Dr. Cush's retirement in 1982 and to honor him, the University of Texas at Dallas established the Polycarp Cook Lecture Series and each spring since 1985, with the exception of 2020 because of the pandemic, one of our esteemed faculty colleagues has delivered a lecture with a theme related to the concerns of the lively mind. At this time, I would like to recognize the former Cush lecturers who are here today. Please stand to be recognized. Through the annual Cush event, the University of Texas at Dallas simultaneously honors a former colleague, Dr. Polycarp Cush, and a current distinguished colleague. Today, that colleague is Dr. Elaine Ben Susan. Dean Perkul, please come forward to introduce Dr. Ben Susan. It's a distinct pleasure 
to introduce my friend, Alain. Um, Alain came to us almost 20 years ago, precisely 20 years ago, I think. Um, I remember uh, my dear colleague, Suresh Sethi, appearing in my office one day, and he had, he had a great idea. And the great idea was Alain Ben Susan. And, uh, and uh, I, you know, I looked at Alain's resume, I said, this guy is incredible, but he's not a business faculty. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and Suresh said, that doesn't matter. You know, he can help all of us. <laughs> he is that good. And I said, you know, okay, let's, let's think about it. And we walked, we talked to others, and maybe we thought we could uh, do an appointment across schools, but in the end, we said, okay. You know, we are going to, this is a treasure, this is a find, and we are not going to miss this treasure, and we hired him, and that's one of the best decisions we did, and credit goes to Suresh. You know, when Alain joined us, my young colleagues, young but highly accomplished, uh, some of them already held professorships and chairs, attended his class to learn stochastic control from him. And they wrote papers based on what they have learned. So Lane contributed, continues to contribute tremendously to our school. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce him today. Uh, Elaine has uh, uh, graduated from, now I'm going to, Please forgive me, butcher French, right and left. Uh, so, Ecole Polytechnique in 1962, master's degree in mathematics and science. So that's, that's where Alain's at least academic life starts. And then he went on to Ecole Nationale de la Statistique at the, at the la Administration Economic, uh, master's degree in economics and statistics, 1965. Went on to get a PhD in mathematics from Paris University and in 1969 and, and joined the university as a faculty member at that year. So uh, now I'm going to jump. Uh, to UTD, and I will go back again in terms of uh, his uh, career. Uh, so, career starting at the end here to back. So, uh, he is a Lars Magnus Ericsson Distinguished Chair uh, and Director of International Center for Risk and Decision Analysis which he set up in 2004 when he joined and funded it with, uh, with uh, international funding as well as, uh, as well as local funding. And this center played a very important role because he has supported and advised many PhD students and, and done a tremendous amount of research through the center. Uh, so we shared, uh, so he's been with us since 2004, but along the way, we shared him with the folks in a couple universities in Hong Kong. So from 2009 to 2012, Hong Kong Polytechnic, I remember they had a very ambitious uh, dean in their business school, this lady, I was actually mentoring her. I must have mentored her too well. The next thing I know, she is trying to hire Ben Susan away from us. 
<laughs> so Alain did not, of course, go, but, uh, but we have agreed that uh, he will spend half of his time there and half of his time here. So uh, then he moved on to uh, Hong Kong City University, uh, City University of Hong Kong, and spent some time until 2019, actually, with them, again on the same kind of an arrangement. So uh, before he joined us, uh, he was at University of Paris, Dauphine. Uh, so I said he joined in 69. And then, you know, in France, it's, they have mandatory retirement. <laughs> so they, uh, they retired them in 2004, I think. And uh, in the meantime, uh, while he was uh, while he was uh, teaching, he has many many additional responsibilities. Uh, you know, if you look at Alain's resume, there are hundreds and hundreds of papers there, and I cannot imagine a person having the kind of responsibilities he has had, administrative responsibilities and continuing to produce the kind of research he has produced. Just mind-boggling. He was president of INRIA. This is the French research lab for information technology and control. 1984 to 1996. They are three-year terms. They appointed him four times, if I'm not mistaken, in a row. And he had over a thousand scientists working for him. And this INRIA flourished under his leadership. And then in 1996, they appointed him as the president of the French Space Agency. Again, a very highly prestigious and incredibly time consuming job. Um, and uh, he was, uh, until February 2003, he was in that role. And during that time, he was elected chairman of the European Space Agency, Council for European Space Agency, and so until to, uh, 2002. And along the way, as if all of this was not enough, he was part-time faculty, at Ecole Polytechnique at Paris, and uh, in Ecole Normale Superior, Paris. Uh, he took a leave and went to European, a newly created European Institute for Advanced Studies in Management in Brussels. And he was there twice, 71 to 73. And then later, 77 to 79, he went to be the director of this institute. And he was instrumental in transforming that institute so that it is sustainable. Today, we talk about sustainability. I am sure Alain will talk, as, as he, he uh, makes remarks, maybe mention what he did there and how how this institute survived. Uh, and all the way back, he was the mathematics department chair at Paris University, 75 to 77. So an incredible journey full of administrative as well as academic contributions. Um, I am going to go over uh, the awards Alain has, has received, and I'm gonna leave it at that. Otherwise, I could be here and giving the lecture for him. Um, so, uh, the, his most recent award is the IEEE Control Systems Award, 2023. This year, he received this. And, uh, in, you know, it came with $10,000, Alain is, still gonna buy me a dinner 
No, he didn't buy me a dinner. I take that back. <laughs> so, um, and a very, very prestigious award that's given to him by the Control Society, IEEE Control Society. Uh, Siam, uh, WT, and Idalia Reed Prize, 2014. He was fellow of American Mathematical Society in 2013, fellow of SIAM in 2009, member of French Academy of Sciences, 2003. It's not easy to get into this academy. It is not easy, and he did it relatively young. I think most people take a lot longer to get in. Is that correct, Alan? <laughs> um, Legion d'honneur officer, 2003. Uh, Bundes, Verdeen's close. And switching from, from <laughs> French to German. Uh, award recognition officer, 2003. NASA, Distinguished Public Service Medal in 2000. Order, Order National du Merit, Commander, 2000. Member of the French Academy of Technology, 2000. Member of the International Academy of Astronautics, 1999. Member of Academia Europa, 1985. Fellow of IEEE, 1985. One Humboldt Prize, 1984. So I think you have a, a few prizes. Congratulations, my friend. And without further ado, I want to call him and to give his talk. Alain? Yeah, yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Asami is so open minded that he hired a mathematician in the School of Management. <laughs> well, trust my friend, Suresh Sethi. Let me uh, thank Mr. President for the presence here, Mr. Mrs. Provost, thank you very much, Madame la Consul Générale de France for your presence, thank you colleagues, friends, and fellow students. Okay, so I am a mathematician in the School of Management. Why? Because management science is a gold mine for mathematicians. The problems of mathematics arising from management science are so diverse, so broad, and from my test, more interesting than the problem coming from physics. <laughs> from my test, okay. Uh, they are diverse and a lot in common, by the way. So this is not so much enough known, but it is reality, and I wanted to send this message. Now, before I enter into the role of mathematics in management science, I want to mention something about innovation. Because innovation in general is related to technology. Invention, new, 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 new results, and so on. The progress tec is technology. It's rare that people think that innovation for management science. So, uh, and I want to give you a, a counter example where innovation in management science was key. And I've chosen, because of my, my space background, I've chosen the most impressive undertaking of all times up to now, the Apollo mission. Okay? And uh, I first want to recall 
what President Kennedy said in May 25, 1961, where he gave to America the objective of landing a man on the moon within the end of a decade, so before 1970. Well, uh, you know, uh, I said, I was always uh, curious, who was behind this speech? Who, who, uh, who uh, proposed this speech? So usually a uh, president of a country, someone uh, writes a speech and so on. So I asked Chad GPT, <laughs> so who inspired President Kennedy? I, I, Chad GPT said, I don't know. And uh, I, I went to Wikipedia, I said, I made a lot of search, no name comes. So my feeling is that it is himself. <laughs> no one advised him, he said that. Of course, the context was very clear, there was a, the, the, the fact that the Soviet Union was ahead of America in those days. And 61 is a year where the first man in space was Russian. Yuri Gagarin, okay? And uh, it was a big shock for America, it was a big challenge, and uh, for President Kennedy it was really, and there was some success with the Mercury mission, where American on the, on, on, on the space came after Gagarin, but not that far after him. Uh, in 1961, I was a student at the Ecole Polytechnique. I was 21 years old, so I was born in 1940. <laughs> of course, the speech of Kennedy was impressed the world. It's probably one of the speech which remains unforgettable, and uh, I don't see anything comparable to that. Uh, and in this year, everybody was uh, uh, thinking, well, is that possible? And the answer was no, no. The, uh, the probability, I remember very well, the, the study, the, the people say probability is less than 10% that this is possible, that will be done. I was at the Ecole Polytechnique, I had a class in astrophysics, professor of astrophysics, very concerned about that. I still have a lecture notes in my home in France, and there, and so I can, I can show if you want. The guy said, it's impossible. That cannot be done. He was sure. So, so the reason why probably it was his idea is because an expert could not have said that. Because any expert would have said, it's impossible. It's not possible. <laughs> I cannot put that in the mouth of the, uh, the president. So that's why I think it is himself. Now here, he may was not conscious of that, but there were two challenges there. Number one, the technology's challenge. The man on the moon, nobody had done that before, of course. It's so obviously a technology challenge. But the second one is before the end of a decade. Okay? Well, if he had said uh, America, um, the, the first uh, man on the moon will be an American, he could have said that, that's fine. People would say, well, okay, maybe, uh, but the real challenge was before the end of a decade. That was a challenge. And this challenge was managerial challenge. It was not a technological challenge. So people, if you look at all the videos about um, Apollo mission, who gets the credit? You c there are a lot of videos which tell you m m the Apollo mission, the de technological challenges of Apollo mission, uh, and the credit goes to this man, Werner von Braun, the famous German legendary rocket scientist uh, who, di who, has, who is at the origin of the Saturn V rocket, something which is unprecedented, such a huge rocket which is still not 
uh, there is nothing comparable uh, up to now. And, uh, well, if you know a little bit about Mission Apollo, you come to Werner von Braun. And all, all, of course, he was a genius in technology, a genius in engineering. He was a, a very innovative and so on to understand all the problems, and that, that's clear. But he was also a manager. He was a team leader, a project leader, and very charismatic and so on. But in management, he was not innovative. And because of that, without innovation in management, the challenge stated by President Kennedy would have failed. So the guy who should get credit is this guy, George Mueller. I don't know if you know this name. Uh, George Mueller challenged Werner van Braun and said, with the way you manage a program, it won't work. You will not be able to do it. Of course, to say that to Van Braun, you must be very bold, okay? Because Van Braun knows rockets, right? And uh, still this guy said, no, it won't work. And finally, he succeeded in convincing Van Braun, and they adopted a totally innovative managerial way of handling missions. So if you look at all the videos, it's, you don't see that. It is not so much about the managerial challenge of Apollo mission. A lot is about technology, the difficulty of a rocket, and blah, blah, and so on, which is true, of course. Very little about management. Nevertheless, I found Andrew Chekin, who is an American writer, and uh, who wrote about the management of the Apollo mission. So here I summarize in this, uh, I summarize here in this uh, chart uh, the thing that uh, characterizes some, the new approach of management. Well, I will not comment everything, we take too much time. First of all, only two things which don't uh, relate immediately. Well, it has a manager, you need to have a clear goal. The goal must be clear. Okay, that's maybe, uh, maybe it seems common sense, but in general, uh, it's not the case. The second thing is you must have money. Okay, sufficient resources. Money was not the problem. The budget of NASA in those days was 5.5% of the federal budget of United States, 5.5%. Now, the budget of NASA is 0.4% of the budget of federal budget. That makes, so money was not a problem, it's important. But the key change, what comes next, systems approach. That's something totally innovative in those days. Now it, it, is, it has been understood, it has been understood, and we have in HUTD, Department of Systems Engineering, and, uh, and uh, okay. So let me, uh, let me uh, comment a little bit about that. Müller was appointed, uh, by the way, speaking of money, the NASA administrator was James Webb, the guy of a telescope, okay? <laughs> uh, James Webb said, okay, how much it cost? It will cost. So the, the team came with, it will cost $12 billion. So he went to OMB and he said, it will cost 24 billion dollars and OMB gave immediately to NASA 24 billion dollars and at the end of the day it cost 24 billion <laughs> so uh, this is not mathematics but it's uh, okay and and uh, so Muller was appointed by James Webb associate administrator of NASA head of manned space flight program and he changed completely the, the management that was, from Brown was following. Uh, so, th so this is based on systems engineering. It is not called that way. It 
it is known uh, as uh, all test, all up testing. The idea is this. When you have a very complex system, the fact that each part of the system works very well tells nothing about the system as a whole. Okay? The fact that you qualify, you validate each part, you have not progressed at all in understanding the validation of a system because of linkage. Parts can grow very well, but together they don't work. So to validate, you have to validate the system. This is totally new. Before, the, the idea was take your time, you validate this part, you validate this, you validate this, and so on, and that, that takes decades. So it could not have been succeeded without this fundamental change, which was risky. Muller said himself, I was lucky, because uh, if it, were, it would have failed, it would have been my my responsibility. I would have been fired, <laughs> okay? Uh, surprisingly, Muller left NASA in 69 after the success. 69, by the way, as Hassan said, I got my PhD in, uh, in March 69. And I got an invitation from UCLA you cannot believe what it represented for me to go to California. California was a dream, okay? <laughs> and, and then, not only I went to California, but I watched the landing on the moon in California, <laughs> which is really uh, something which I, beyond what I could believe, okay? He left 69 after, and this guy wanted to do Reusable. He wanted to have a reusable, rock fully launched ve vehicle, which is reusable, because he had worked for, with a shuttle, which is reusable. Re and he founded, uh, he founded, he, he was in CEO of Kistler Aerospace, and I met him. It was a memorable meeting. This was in 99 or 98, something like that, 99 maybe. I was president of a French agency, space agency, and uh, European space agency, and M Muller came. He was, old, he was about 80 years old. He died in 2015, he was 97, and uh, he was about 80, and he was looking for cooperation with the Europeans for his uh, new rocket type of rocket. Maybe we should have listened to him. Unfortunately, he, he charming person, very humble, very low key. I cannot believe that this guy said to Von Braun, you will fail. <laughs> <laughs> that is really something amazing. The, so, uh, Muller could not succeed. In his uh, idea, the guy who succeeded is Elon Musk uh, with his uh, fantastic project. And the Falcon 9 is practically reus reusable. And that's why right now, with this type of rocket, uh, the cut of space travel has been uh, reduced extensively. Imagine if you have a plane if you have a plane, you go somewhere, and then uh, that's it. Uh, the, the plane is uh, dead after you did that. That's totally insane, right? And uh, OK, so that's why today this guy, Elon Musk, although I must say it's not, this person is not bringing so much change in technology. Again, this guy is bringing change in management. Uh, we could study a lot about uh, Elon Musk's achievement in Tesla, in SpaceX, and so on. It will take too long, but his innovation is mainly in the managerial approach of uh, initiatives and mission and so on. So here are some of the things connected to his way to handle. But now, 
time is going fast, so uh, my talk is about, in fact, is about, I'm mean, using history of the time, so I'm telling you something of history. And uh, I want to discuss the history of reparations research because this history is also mine. Because I was born at when operation research started to be considered, the, the, the word uh, operational research was coined in 1940, which is the year of my birth, by British Air Ministry scientists. The, the Brits are, have always been a little bit ahead, but the Americans are able to <laughs> realize things. And the idea of operational research is fantastic. There is research there. And there is operations. Operations means military operations, okay? The objective was military. Uh, research means you need science for operations, not for, not for technology. Uh, of course, technology is fine. You need uh, a lot of science, but you need science for operations. Operations mean management. So the idea of introducing scientific methods and uh, science in to to make the military operation effective is something remarkable and has come to operations research. And uh, I like this story because, of course, I was, as I said, born at that time. I was working in this field. I made my career there, my professional experience, and so on. So, I, of course, I love this story. It's true that already with the Second World War, it was clear that the U.S. superiority in production and logistics was key for, the, for, for winning the war. But what is amazing to me most is the, the vision of his generals. The vision, incredible general, and this guy, Arnold, uh, commanding general of the Army Air Force, said this. Which look at that. During this war, the Army, Army Air Force, and the Navy have made an unprecedented use of scientific and industrial resources. The conclusion is inescapable that we have not yet established the balance necessary to ensure the continuance of teamwork among the military, over government associates, industry, and the university. So this guy, a uh, military a general, operational guy, had the vision that they needed science to be effective in, in operations. And they created uh, remarkable institutions. The most in interesting one is the RAND Corporation. RAND means research and development. RAND Corporation was, and there are many others, but RAND Corporation probably was the most important one. And they developed operations research a lot. All the mathematics, major uh, results of mathematics are due to the work of done in RAND Corporation. And after defense, operations research became uh, overwhelming in, uh, in, uh, in uh, business and industry in general, in production, inventory management, supply chain, scheduling, resource allocation, all that is operation research. And a lot of new mathematics uh, was uh, developed thanks to that, and in particular to the work of the RAN. Uh, I want to say that it's important here to look at the general context in those days. Those days means the period 1950 to 1980, 1995. I claim here it's a world of relative stability in the sense that, of course, there was a Cold War. There was two, two, uh, two, uh, two big countries, United States and the Soviet Union, opposed to each other in conflict, but they were rational. There was a deterrence of nuclear balance, and they behaved rationally. Also, Soviet Union was totally closed. So there's no economic interference. So the development was mostly domestic. Uh, economic growth was viewed inside the countries. There was no globalization, very little, no climate change consideration, no sustainable development. 
information technology was expanding, of course, but not with the thing that we see now with the, probably the risk of artificial intelligence or other, okay? So it was uh, relatively stable, and they probably we can summarize the challenge in economics. It w I will not spend time on that. It was a theory of equilibrium. Uh, if there are questions, I can, I can, with the work of Aro de Breu and, uh, and also the French uh, Allais, because he was writing in French, uh, of course, he got a Nobel Prize after Aro and De Breu. De Breu was a student of Valais. Uh, in management science, I would say the objective was to be efficient. So to be efficient means uh, you have limited resources. Within these limited resources, you have to get the best of them. Okay, that's management. You get a good manager if you do that. So it means that optimization was key. Uh, and the world was mostly deterministic. So, of course, there were development of uncertainties and probability uh, so was there, but as an extension of the a, of a, of a deterministic uh, model, okay? Is the same with the games, which I will... Okay, so these are the new mathematics developed for a while, basically uh, optimization under constraints and Thing. So let and algorithm, algorithm of optimization. Okay, so operation research today is obviously a very established science. There is a journal of operations research, which if you publish there, uh, our dean will be very happy. Uh, there is mathematics of operations research, which emphasizes the role of mathematics. But at the same time, for something which we can debate, uh, the world seems to have disappeared in, uh, in the business schools. And it's uh, maybe, I'm not sure it's uh, so good, but let's, mat let's leave that. Control theory. Control theory is, uh, does not come from, did not come from management or economics. It came for space again space issue. I'm referring to modern control theory. Before control theory, they existed. There was something, but, but really what we call modern control theory was uh, uh, because of space. It's the control of dynamic system. Everything is a dynamic system, by the way. If you, uh, something which is not dead is dynamic, so it's a dynamic system. So a rocket is a dynamic system, an aircraft, but also a corporation. Also UTD is a dynamic system, right? A country is a dynamic system. We are a dynamic system. So we have a state which characterizes uh, us, or the system, and there is guidance, so decisions and uncertainties, okay? So all that as an element of uh, what we call dynamic system and the beginning of control theory. So uh, why it came with space? Because the problem, the basic problem of control theory is the following. How do we guide a rocket to put a payload on a given orbit? Because a rocket is a tank, a tank of propellant, big tank. The, uh, the useful thing is one person. The rest is, is fuel. It's the worst way to transport something useful <laughs> somewhere. And uh, you need to minimize it. You need to minimize that consumption. So to minimize, to put, to put on a given a payload on a given orbit with minimizing the fuel consumption is the key problem. And this is the model problem of control theory. So the development of mathematics were fantastic and uh, run corporation play a big role. In this matter, you always see an American and a Russian. It does not mean that they work together. They did not even know each other, but they were doing the same thing in different countries, okay? So there are a lot of examples. The most famous is Bellman and Pontryagin. Uh, and uh, immediately, the, well, very soon, the economics and manage, ma people in management science get interested in uh, control theory, in economics, Aro, uh, whom I mentioned already, and my 
my colleague, Suresh, and his uh, uh, a colleague and friend, <laughs> uh, and his uh, supervisor, Thompson, were among the pioneers to use optimal control theory in management science. Okay, at the same time, the world was changing, changing greatly. Uh, and uh, the issue of efficiency was less relevant than before. Why? Because the risk came, uncertainties became overwhelming and created to be efficient and you may be very efficient and uh, if uh, someday immediately you collapse which could have happened to many companies and uh, so it means uh, the risk is the most important thing so risk and certainty start to prevail and competition fierce competition uh, for a lot of crises so this became the um, the main objective to, to, uh, to, to, to fulfill uh, when you are an entity, an organization, a company, a country, uh, rather than efficiency. So management of risk became key thing. I can give in my class a lot of examples. Telco, Tokyo Electric Power Company, Boeing, we have seen uh, what happened to Boeing and of course how to adapt to a changing world artificial intelligence is one thing issues in environment energy globalization and we see now returns to fundamentals production okay here stochastic things and game theory become so new mathematics came stochastic control instead of deterministic control and and different and games instead of just single optimization okay i i don't have time to discuss mathematical finance it's a very particular thing where by during a period from the 70s to the financial crisis the banks were hiring phd in mathematics they were not coming to management science they were coming to mathematics they wanted to buy to, to get jobs to mathematicians to probabilists also to physicists and uh, and it's very s and then it's, it's changed with a with a crisis if there are questions about that i can comment and now these are probably i made a, a list of new items real options uh, green production circular economics Stochastic maintenance, it's extremely important. I work on it. Pricing management, risk management, complex system. Here is an example of complex system, how to manage a smart grid. A smart grid where you have many producers, many consumers, uh, public, private, and so on. So how to, how to manage such uh, complexity. Game theory. Game theory, in fact, the word game is, is historical. It is related to games of chance. Now it's more conflict, it's not games, it's conflict. But it's, it's good to, uh, to say at this stage that fantastic mathematician had g should great credit for the development of game theory. I want to mention two names, John Feynman. John Feynman uh, was a fantastic mathematician in PD and so on. He is a guy who invented computers. Who invented computers? John Feynman. And this guy was also interested in economics. And he worked with an economist, Oscar Morgenstern, and they developed a famous book, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, where a lot of new things were, um, are mentioned. Okay? The second one I want to mention is John Nash. No, John Nash is also a fantastic mathematician in PD and so on. He got the Abel Prize in mathematics. He's the only one who got the Abel Prize in mathematics and the Nobel Prize in economics. No one has done that for the famous Nash game. Okay. Uh, and in the time which remains before, uh, I still have a little bit of time, I hope, I want to mention what's new now. And I want to... Uh, mention minfield games minfield games is a new mathematics 
arising coming for, from economic and I think managerial consideration. But it is adapted from physics. The idea is the following. In physics, you have a macro, macro you have a microscopic level and a macroscopic level, right? So if you look at a fluid, a gas, and so on, if you look at the microscopic, you have a billions of particles, right? And these they move, they move, they move, they move together, and at the end of the day, they form uh, something at the macroscopic level where it looks like a fluid or it looks like a uh, gas. Huh? And for which you can find laws, specific laws, which are much easier than if you were looking at the microscopic and trying to follow the particles themselves directly. So, so that's physics. That's the, the credit. And that's why we can summarize physics. It's totally exceptional. It's not true in biology. In physics, we can summarize most of the physics, which is which you don't look at very remote galaxies or nanotechnology and so on. The ordinary physics, you have 10, 15 equations, and that's all. Okay? And that's enough. This does not exist in biology. It does not exist in economics. It only exists in physics and mechanics, of course. So the idea was, why not applying that to social sciences? After all, you, me, we are particles. We are similar, right? Not very different. In million, if you take uh, the population of America, uh, you will, they are, people are different, but at the same time, very similar. So why not having a, something like that in social sciences in general, thinking of people as particles and trying to find a macroscopic uh, behavior of the community? So this genial, this fantastic idea was proposed by these two guys, Pierre Louis Lyon, who is a Fields medalist, and Jean-Michel Lazry. They were colleagues from Paris Dauphine. <laughs> and, uh, and they start to work on this idea. I, I, I will stay on this. And of course, if you want, I can develop that. The, my slides uh, give something more, OK? Let me, let me uh, try to conclude with my uh, the new thing, artificial intelligence. I cannot <laughs> give a, <laughs> such a talk without talking about artificial intelligence. Here also, history is very important. Look at history. Artificial intelligence was created in 1956, one year before the Sputnik, 60 years, 68 years ago. So it's not recent. And um, The ambition of artificial intelligence from the very beginning was used to proceed on the basis of a conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. So we, uh, uh, so the ambition was from the very beginning uh, what we can see now. This undertaking was done by a giant of computer science called John McCarthy, and he connected with colleagues in Dartmouth co College a uh, lot for a summer, not just one conference, a summer research project, three months, all the best minds in uh, the world, and uh, no, in economics, in, uh, in uh, computer science, everywhere, and they end up with uh, this uh, proposal. Since then, it's very interesting to, to study it. There were ups and downs. A lot of passion, a lot of, uh, uh, see, well, uh, and, uh, and uh, now, of course, people say, uh, we have data, we have much more data than before, we have a power of computers, which is, does not compare with what was before. And the ambition is, uh, is, uh, is there. So it's great. So there will be a lot of stuff. It is also a gold mine for mathematicians. The mathematics problem behind that are tremendous. And uh, so look at the story of uh, 
of, uh, of, um, uh, of artificial intelligence before deciding what to do. And I conclude, so I, you may see I'm biased, you may think I'm biased towards mathematics, yes, but mathematics cannot do everything. Can do a lot, for sure, but not everything. What the mathematician cannot do is this, one thi uh, what the key thing. All the mathematical models in management science or in economics are based on the assumption of rationality. Okay? So we don't know how to model non-rationality. Non and it turns out that humans are rational, for sure, but they are not just rational. They have other feelings. And the most important one is, what the, is the ego. Okay? And with the ego, unfortunately, you become in a non-rational way, and that mathematics is cannot do that. So it means, and that's my conclusion, that management science must remain multidisciplinary. It's not just a mathematical field. Mathematics plays an essential role, a big role, a very important role, but not everything. So we need to remain multidisciplinary with, of course, quantitative techniques, but also organizational techniques and psychological aspects and on equal footing. That's the, that makes management science even more interesting than uh, I thought <laughs> as a, it's just an application of mathematics. So I think uh, I'm done here. I don't know if there are questions. In a few minutes, we can take questions. Yes, now you. Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. I've seen sometimes that the most important factor is fear. Would you comment on that? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. You are per absolutely right. First of all, I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't know nothing about psychology. So it's not my field at all. So I'm discovering that. So it's my experience of, I've seen the cases I studied, ego. But ego is also fear. Because it's also fear. It means it, ego is also a protection. Uh, uh, you, when you have your ego and you try to impose your opinion on, on people, you say, I am right, you are wrong. In fact, what you do, if you think a little bit, what you do is because you have fear of the others. You are fear, fearing to confront the others. So you say, no, you are wrong. I'm, ri I'm right, I'm right, okay? So it is connected, but I don't have enough knowledge of psychology to comment further. Yes. Control theory plays in deep learning. In you, what? You are in deep learning, back problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. It's what I teach, in fact. <laughs> where, where is it headed, in your opinion? Yeah, I teach, I teach deep learning. Uh, no, I did machine learning and control theory. Uh, in fact, it's very interesting because when uh, one of the advice of people who want to do that is the don't be, the terminology which is used now is totally new, but the content is not new. In my time, in my dissertation, my dissertation, 69, I did identification of systems governed by partial differential equations. The word was identification. So you had a dynamic system, you don't know, you don't know it, and you learn and decide at the same time. The word identification has disappeared. And now it's called machine learning. 
But if you look at the concept, it's exactly the same thing. It does not mean that there are no new ideas, uh, but in terms of conceptual, people have not tried to find, to look at what existed before, which is a mistake, because you should learn from history. Now, coming to your question, deep well, in fact, control theory, what is control theory exactly? Control theory is an optimization problem. It's a part of optimization, but a very specific part where there is time. So, okay. And if you look at deep learning, deep learning is a, a, a set of layers, right? So you have neural, net you are, uh, neural networks and you keep having layers and layers. And in fact, it's like introducing a time. The, the number of a the layer is analogous of a time. And therefore, first of all, uh, machine learning is, a, is an optimization problem. Supervised learning is an optimization problem. And deep learning, which is a sequence, is exactly a control problem. <laughs> but no wonder that control theory plays, can play a big role there. And this is what I teach in my class. You, you, you look at videos of back back pro there's something very, very uh, back propagation of a gradient and so on, with these techniques. They are absolutely clear when you look at the control theory point of view. Okay, Alain, <laughs> I, I will, je vais parler en anglais. <laughs> um, I'm very glad that you mentioned the importance of the psychological sciences in management. Um, when I was discussing with our university president in a hallway recently, I said we need to enable the neurosciences to cross the arts and humanities, and now the neurosciences and psychology and management. So I think we are going through an interesting period where neuroscience and psychology is helping us understand much better how humans function, and you've done some of it. But then I guess my question maybe for the provost <laughs> is how, how might we apply some of these methods to the growth of our own university? Has your management mathematics been applied to structures like universities? Like what? Like universities, which oh, are growing yeah. rapidly. Um, but but you know, how, how do you apply theory to practice in our own context? Yeah. Is there a question for the problem? But, but I can say myself before, I don't know what you, what you will say, but uh, I've been an administrator, it was mentioned. And I can tell you, mathematics was extremely useful for me. The, the, the I applied the principle of mathematics and I can tell you a few of them which are totally valid for any organization. Number one, the principle of simplicity. You have to simplify. You have to simplify. If, if you look at everything at the same time, it's impossible. And the mathematical problem is always extremely difficult. Always extremely difficult. It's incredibly difficult. You are not going to solve it by just confronting the problem. You have to simplify what is the most important and keep it piece by piece, okay? And this is exactly what is needed when you have an organization, you are in charge, what is key? I mentioned, uh, for instance, that because of the change of the world, the fact that efficiency, although obviously important, is today less important than risk, okay? So risk is more important than being efficient because you can be very efficient and die immediately. Okay, so, that, so, that, so you have to, to rank your, uh, your, 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 your to rank and simplify. You need to have a strategy, what to do, what are my goals. Remember the, what I said, a clear goal. So all of these are in mathematics. If you want to solve a mathematical problem, you need to simplify, you need to have a strategy, and, uh, and you need to discuss, you need to talk to people. The scientists, the mathematicians, they talk to each other a lot, and this is the same. You have to get insight from 
your people in the organization and, uh, and discuss and listen and then decide. So these principles are valid in mathematics and they are valid in running an organization. I don't know if you agree, <laughs> or president, maybe. Okay. Uh, what's that? It's a dynamic system. Okay, that's really good. Huh? Okay. Do we have other questions? If there are none, thank you, Alan. <laughs> nice report. <laughs>